California wines are typically actually more in the 14 percent or higher wow. range of alcohol versus Italy is going to be like in the 11, wow. you know, to 13 percent. So oh, wow, yeah. California wines. 14 and a half. Right. See, there you go. So you, <laughs> I did go to school. Ladies and gentlemen, she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're listening to Studio 22. Welcome to Studio 22. I'm Will Meldman here with my co-host Brock O'Hearn. How what's, you? <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> Very special guest today, Abigail Torres. She's here right now with us. She's a level two sommelier on her way to level four. And her and her husband, Mike Torres, are literally like brother and sister to me and my siblings. They've been with Discovery Land Company for almost two decades now. Welcome to Studio 22. Hi, thanks bro. And my other bro, Yeah, my new bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been a few years. A couple, couple years, yeah. I found out uh, the first time I saw you and Penny together that she likes you a lot more than me. Yep. <laughs> yep. I know. <laughs> a, I'm her auntie. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big deal. She, Penny goes nuts for you, it's awesome. I know. Yeah. I think um, she could smell me outside the door when I was walking up. I was with so, the cookies. Or yeah, something? no. Well, I, or just, just, you. I just think yeah. she was like Abby's here. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Dogs can like sense that. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks. For, thanks for coming on. I'm so excited. I'm just excited to to talk to you guys and open up some doors about some things and and it's going to be a long story, but it's going to end very well. So. Yeah. We're, you can't go wrong with that on the table. <laughs> it's going to end well. It all ends well. Yeah, I think uh, we're super excited about the idea of having you on, not only because it's you, but also because we can do some fun wine stuff. Exactly. I have to tell you guys, I was, um, I've been, I, I was thinking the other day and I asked a friend, I said, gosh, when did podcasts come out? And I was thinking, had these come out 20, 25 years ago, not to downplay like therapy or anything because- yeah. Obviously, it's amazing to have therapists come on podcasts and doctors and whatever. But had this, we had this access, you know, two de decades ago. I was like, gosh, it could have saved me in my twenties so much heartache and pain. Or I felt like I maybe I could have gone through things quicker, or you know, with support. Or just, it's amazing because you can type in anything, mm -hmm. you know, with podcasts and go. I can find relationship advice. I can find spiritual advice. I can, you know, just, it's like Presley Gerber was talking about. It's like, it can do the thinking for me. And it's mm -hmm. almost a form of like meditation. And I just think like podcasts are so amazing in this yeah. way. And, and it's sad to hear like, you know, our mental health crisis that we have in the United States and depression and anxiety and it's like if we got our youth more like listening to these things and these outlets within podcasts and what you guys even bring to the table is like there's so much to learn. And honestly, it's therapy even to myself. Yeah. I mean, I go on a walk and plug in you guys and listen. It's like I'm either learning or growing or just being entertained. It's, you know, isn't that crazy? If yeah. had we had that access... It can kind of take music's place, right? Like if you're working out or in the car or something where it's a little more intellectually stimulating than like music, obviously, um, rather than just like vibing out to a good tune, which is good and therapeutic as well, but yep. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And there's so many that are just niche podcasts. So exactly to your point, you know, you could find someone like Andrew Huberman who will go into your health and, and biology and, and you can learn tricks that give you better sleep, that help your mental state, that help your physiology, like it goes on and on. And then to the other part where I, I love listening to the Smartless podcast, you know, you've got these guys mm -hmm. that are uh, all big actors and then they bring in big talent. And for me, someone who works in the industry uh, the, of Hollywood, me and Will as well, um, you learn so much about these high level people that you would never have access to, you know? And that's across the board with all these different podcasts, right? Totally. Yeah, I do. Uh, I only get my film and television reviews from like YouTube essentially, because you have, you get direct access to individuals that right. give their direct opinion. And it's not a corporation telling you that might own the studio of the movie they're reviewing. Right. Mm -hmm. So I find podcasts and YouTube and all that very helpful in that regard as well for movie reviews. I just, it just, you know, and you can get it for free. 
you know, and yeah. that, you know, the accessibility to it, it, it just, it has helped me so much. I just think over all these years of just finding an escape or needing help in a certain area and just being able to like type it in and just get it and listen to it and mm-hmm. listen to people talk. Cause that's what therapy is anyways. It's people talking something through. And I guess, you know, the podcast is you get different perspectives from people to get that information to yourself. And it's just so, I, I just, I go, gosh, my life would have, would it, it just, I, it could have helped me so much more, I think, when I was even younger. Right. Maybe you would have started one, right? And like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then I also. You still could, by the I, way. I, I know. So, well, I'm, I'm like going in my head. Like, wait, could have. Like, you could well, do like. Well, it's like I a, told you, I said, you know, when you were first texting me about this, I was like, I have always wanted a platform to talk about stuff, you know. Hell yeah. Um, but, but you know, I have a really funny story. It's like. The thing is, like, I think it was the end of January. I was walking out of West Hollywood, like, early in the morning. It was freezing, like, you know, because we've had this crazy L.A. winter. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I was listening to a Mel Robbins podcast, and she's walking down Melrose after getting coffee with her, like, her two daughters or her assistant. It was some... And she's, I literally have her in my ears and I'm (laughs) looking at her and she's staring at me because I I think I just had this look on my face of like, and I just go, good morning. I was just so (laughs) like, I didn't want to be like, Hey, I'm, I'm, you're in my ear right now. I couldn't say that, but I was like, it was so, I was so excited. And I just wanted to stop her and just, but she probably gets it all the time. And just like, you change my life. Like you change You've Incredible. helped my projection on and my thought process on things so much. Well, I'm sure she would have appreciated any <sighs> anything you said. Yeah. What's her podcast called? It's the Mel Robbins podcast. Mel Robbins. Yeah, there we go. yeah, it's in, it's incredible. She's on like the top ten at least, incredible. I think in the in the world. I'll she's insane. Yeah, yeah, she's she's that. she helps so much with like anxiety and narcissism, and um, she does like she has like the 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 five, four, three, two, one, where she just, it's what gets her up out of bed. It's just mm. like no holding back. There's no pushing the yeah. snooze button. It's just five, four, three, two, one, get out of bed. You know, um, she, she just is very motivational. I in love those that. Things. We also had like, speaking of um, like, you know, therapists and podcasts, we had uh, the real coach Lee on, <laughs> uh, you know, a Troubadour yep. member. Great, great guy. We're talking to him about maybe even doing another one. Now that we're like over a year in, it's like we might, you know, consider doing episode two with people, right? Like it's kind of, so maybe in like six months from now, we'll have some new wine and we'll be doing, oh we'll be rocking episode <laughs> yeah. two. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like for people listening out there, you know, and you're, you can totally relate to what Abby's saying. Go check out the, uh, the coach Lee episode after this. Yeah. yeah. And that's a big part of us doing this podcast too, is, is one having a very unique network and their stories to, you know, success and whatever that looks like for them. And we get to deep dive that into a degree with a lot of people. And what you learn along the way is phenomenal. And so much of that is mindset, right. And, and how we show up in the world. So whenever we get to deep dive, whether it's emotionally or, you know, financially, uh, uh relationship in, with anyone around you, like, the more that we can learn about that, it's, I almost feel like me and Will get to be selfish in a way uh, because we get to do all the interviewing and listening to these people firsthand. So we've heard every podcast we've ever done, you know, and with these incredibly talented people and you're one of them that we're very excited to talk about. And and I want to get into your story and, oh and how you're sitting here right now. Oh my gosh. I, I was asking Will, I was like, why, did, why me? <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, come on. I mean, I, I mean it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a long story. I think I have that on one of my s- social media like quotes. It's like, it's a long story, but it all turns out well, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that's with a lot of people. And it, like you said, that podcasts, I feel like sometimes can be really selfish. Like it's not, it's not like I'm trying to put my, you know, we're not trying to put ourselves on a pedestal here and be like, no. listen to me or I want to hear myself talk or, you know, I think that really in the end, like you guys always talk about is communication, friendship, relationships, you know, in the end within this world, that's what, what we're trying to, to do better, you Mm -hmm. know, and you know, it's the second, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and, and that's how we do it is by listening and talking and, and sharing. And I also think like listening to different podcasts, 
sometimes it's not even relatable to something I'm feeling or going through or, but you never know who's going to come into your life and go, oh my gosh. And they, they bring this up and you go, I was just listening to a podcast about that, you know, and, mm. or, you know, it's like, and to be able to meet someone where they're at and give them hope or advice or just be like, God, I heard this incredible saying or something, you know, and I just think, okay, well, maybe my story or something about it would be that to someone else. And yeah. so, yeah. But yeah. You never know who you're helping or who you're reaching. You, you know? have no idea. Yeah. No so idea. let's, let's well, dive in. Mel dive might in. listen to this podcast and say, yeah. Abby, <laughs> yeah, that was incredible. <laughs> there we go. Wait, where should we right. begin? Where should we begin? Um, where were you before Discovery Land, I guess? It, because I, obviously, like, just to reiterate, mm -hmm. you know, been with Discovery Land for almost two decades now, um, and you're still a young person, so that brings you yeah. way back. What led yeah. you here, yeah. So I got into Discovery Land through our my small town that I grew up in, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, up north, which your dad has a property at, Gaza Ranch. So that's how this all kind of connects is coming from that that northern Idaho town. One of the most beautiful towns, like maybe in the entire country. Like yeah. that lake is extraordinary just for anyone listening out there. It's so beautiful. So beautiful. My parents, you know, were from Western Washington and drove over and, you know, 1978 and, you know, just kind of fell upon it. My dad's an architect and was interviewing for a new firm and, and it was like they stumbled upon Coeur d'Alene and it was like, okay, this is it. And they haven't left since. And, mm. you know, my house my, that I grew up in is a, a block from the, from the lake. So I grew up going into the lake and all of this stuff. But yeah, so no, my story is, is interesting in, in that in this small little town, I was this, I have a sister and um, I, there was a professional ballet school in this town, oddly enough. And it's because there was a um, old narcotic um, retired LAPD, or he might've been from Orange County. Mm. And when he retired, they're like, you got to go somewhere safe. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm. like a narcotics officer. Officer, type thing. yes, Got exactly. Okay, okay. And so she, they, her, his, or excuse me, his wife was a professional ballerina and was teaching down here in Southern California after she retired from ballet. So that's how the, it's funny. It's like they, they moved up there to Northern Idaho and she's like, what am I going to do? <laughs> and so she ended up but like, well, fine, I'm just going to open up a ballet school here. So, I mean, my story starts as just, you know, someone in Idaho that I, I was a little girl that would go to my sister's dance recitals and my parents would say that I would be in the aisle, just they couldn't keep me seated because I was, I was always dancing. And then my mom and dad put me in this, you know, like a regular cute little dance class. And the, the dance teacher came up to my parents and was like, you know, your daughter's a little serious about this. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, she She's just not well fitted here because she's too serious about what she's, what, about ballet specifically. And so she suggested, she goes, well, I know this, this, this lady that has opened up a ballet school, but it's very professional. It's very strict. I just want to warn you guys. And, um, but I think, that Abby would be very well suited there. So I think it was like six or so, and, and I go in there and I still have my first pink leotard <laughs> from when I started at that ballet school and I'm keeping it safe in storage. But um, yeah, so I was a, um, this was a professional school and you kind of auditioned to be in there and she would look at you and it was a very like your hair is pulled back, you have a bun, you wear these tights, you wear this unitard or leotard, and then you know, you show up to school and parents, you do not say anything to me. Your daughters are mine. Your children are mine for this hour. And it was just incredible. And I was just in my element. I mean, I was like, <laughs> yes, I was just so in my element. Um, but so they, my life kind of took off from there and I just, you know, it was all by levels and by, uh, you know, kind of age group to kind of keep you. And um, so I, I was this little 
girl in Russian trained um, school for ballet and, and went to school and I didn't have, I didn't do anything else. My life was go to normal school, public school. And then as soon as I got out, it was pull my hair back and get me to the ballet studio as soon as possible. And then, um, you know, I had incredible, there was different ballet companies that would kind of come into town and do auditions and things like that. And so I started getting noticed. So different ballet schools would come, you know, different companies would come through town or they'd go to our closest city was Spokane, Washington, you know, go Zags. And, um, uh, to do like auditions and they would do the Nutcracker and they would, you know, perform. And, um, so there was different companies that would kind of come through just to kind of scout. It was kind of like modeling, you know, it's just kind of like knowing where ballet schools were and to, you know, kind of scout girls and whatever. And, um, you know, by the time I was 10 years old, I, um, my mom and my ballet teacher kept it from me for a whole year, but there was, I had done the, the Nutcracker one year performed, um, with this other company, but then they, they told my parents and my ballet teacher and my, my mom specifically, like, uh, we would like your daughter to, um, actually be Clara, the, the main part. But so would these be productions put on by the town or would no, uh, by your a, teacher? No, it'd be by the company, a company that would come through got it, and got we it. would have to audition to be in that performance. So that was more of like a national company that, yes. so like, okay. Yeah. And they would come and do auditions and, and we would have to audition for different parts in the ballet. Cause they'd have, they'd have their professional, you know, principal dancers, but then they would hire the younger, you know, or not hire, but they would audition the younger students to kind of do some of the fill-in roles and things like that. So that's what we would do. But they had kind of scouted me and told my mom, you know, and my, well, my ballet teacher, you know, we would really like her next year to be our Clara, you know, which wow. was the main part. And they kept it for me, from me for 10 months. And, and it was because, you know, my mom taught me when I was really young, she, I remember her driving me to the ballet studio and she, cause she knew how uh, serious I was, but also had talent. I can say, you know, I, I did, I had natural talent. I loved being on stage and performing and I had big heart and musicality. Super athletic. Yeah. 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 And artistry and, and all of that, that, um, she taught me the word humble when I was little and she goes, you know, Abby, you're, you are very talented and I want to teach you this word humble because no matter what is going to come your way, I just want you to accept things with grace and to, to, to be humble about it. And she was kind of teaching me what that word meant so that, cause I think, she, well, obviously she knew something behind the scenes of that, you know, I was going to get offered things. And also because I had really close friends and we all danced together. And obviously there was other girls too that were even more talented than I was. But there was something, you know, it just there's the sparkle or something that, uh, you know, they see and they, they, you know, it's like acting. It's just like, it's like that guy, you know, mm -hmm. they just, there's something they see that it's just for some reason, even though you could be, there's better people than you, they like your spark. So that's kind of what happened. So it was like October or something. And then I was like, I just want to let you know that you've been asked to be Clara in the Nutcracker. I mean, that was the biggest, biggest deal. And, and in, it, in a way that, you know, I had a news article printed about me with like full front cover, like a whole insert into the newspaper. The really hilarious thing is that they called me Abby Hoffman, which <laughs> my, my, which is like a 70s, like, murderer <laughs> like it was a, oh, wow. my mom was so upset my parents were so upset but they got my name wrong um because that's not my maiden name but they um you know they had that it was like it was a big deal and so that's I think that's why my mom was really trying to teach me that word about humility um so young yeah. because it just like the attention just kind of came because it's a small town and then it was like recognition and she saw the path that you were on right like yeah. the trajectory and like this is serious this is or this is becoming serious and will be serious. yeah 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 so I that's what I by 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 the time I was 11 years old I was you know the main part in this 
you know, in the Nutcracker. And, and oh, wow, that was 11. Yeah, when I was 11. Wow. And, and um, you know, so I, I, I did that. But then um, at 13, you know, the dance world, this is how crazy it was for me. It's like I was so serious that we were even, when I was in middle school, projecting that, like, we needed to accelerate my high school. You know, like mm. I needed to try to, I was trying to graduate by the time I was actually a junior. So by the time I was, you know, in the ninth grade, you know, freshman, sophomore, I was actually taking on more classes and I was taking on sophomore classes plus my freshman classes just wow. so that I could get through high school as fast as possible. Because in the dance world, you know, it's a very young career and you have to be, you know, they're, they're giving you contracts at 17 years old, you know, by the time you're 18, you're with the company and they're paying you. And, um, you know, there's a lot of ballet companies in, in the, in the nation, but there's like the ballet companies, San Francisco ballet, uh, Pacific Northwest ballet in Seattle, uh, New York city ballet, which is a Balanchine style. And then there's American ballet theater in, in New York city as well. And that was my, number one company. You know, that was my, that was my goal. Every, you know, dancer that I looked up to was at American Ballet Theater. And it was the number one ballet company in the United States. And I was like, so when I was little, I already had my eyesight there. It wow. was like, that's what I want to do. So they, they, you know, they really rushed my, well, we just kind of put together with like school counselors and stuff, a kind of a rush schooling program for me. Because there's some ballet schools that like they take on your education too. Like they're so professional that they take on your education. So you're almost homeschooled and wow. then you go to, you know, class for eight hours a day, you know, and then you have four hours of school. Like it's just, it's like that kind of, because your career and your contracts are so young. So, you know, that was my, that was my goal and that was everything. So by the time I was 13, oh, I guess when you're 13 years old, you're able to start auditioning for those big ballet companies. Mm. What they do is they do these summer intensives where 5,000, you know, so it's all the major companies in the United States, which is not that many, like top, top, but um, in the summertime, they're starting to scout you know, male and female dancers. And they, um, there'd be 5,000, three, three to 5,000 people auditioning for that one company. Mm -hmm. And they would only accept 150 dancers. Wow. And so. <clears throat> I mean, this is like a professional sport. I mean, this like D1 sports, professional sports, yeah. like, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's next level. And I mean, we can dive into all that because I think, you know, I think ballet in itself is one of the most, incredible sports because not only do you have to be in the best yeah. of physical shape um you have to have artistry you have to have musicality and then there's you know the musicians that you know the orchestras and then there's you know the costume designers and then there's the set designer i mean it is like a movie I, it you might know? even be above professional yeah, sports I was, it, no it's like, truly yeah, i was truly. gonna say that i have some friends that uh, are are high level ballerinas and I, the only thing I could compare it to is a top level boxer to that level of degree of, of dedication and uh, training that you have to do because it's, I mean, like you said, not only is it a physicality thing, it's you have the art, the creative, you know, the dedication, it's it's your life from start to finish every single day. And it's, it's because if you fall behind just a little bit, whether that's um, flexibility or endurance, cardiovascular endurance, or, you know, weight, I heard is a big issue there too. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different factors. And I think on a team sport specifically, you can get away with a lot more, uh, slack than you would in something like this. Yeah. Because I mean, you, you really are kind of solo in a sense. I mean, there's the corps de ballet, which is where you're dancing with many dancers at once. And then you can become a, then you become a soloist, which is where you get little solo performances within the ballet. And then there's principal dancers that take on the main roles. So that's kind of the hierarchy, you know? Mm. Um, but yeah, like, but in a sport, it's like, you have to have like, you know, in the corps de ballet, you have to all identically look alike you know, or, or your movements and your body and things like that. But it's hard with ballet too, because like I was talking about that spark and that, you know, that it factor that makes someone want you. 
it, you know, you do have an individuality as well in your own artistry and creativity and things like that, that you're trying to be like, look at me, look at me, you know? And, and so it, it's, it's hard because ballet just kind of molds you into what they need specifically. But, you know, at, so at 13, that's when these companies start, at 13 years old, start looking for you. And they can't offer you a contract like legally until you're like, I think, 17 or 16 or seven, you know, later. And, you know, we're still young girls, like just going through, you know, puberty and, you know, life and big change, you know, big changes. So, um, but, it, you know, it's really funny that, you know, my parents would ask their other friends when I was young, they go, how do you raise a child that raises themselves? I mean, because the discipline that I grew up with wasn't because of what not only that my ballet teacher put on me or my parents never put that discipline on me. They didn't have to because I had it in myself that it because, you know, our ballet teacher was like, if you want to get here, you have to give up this. You can't go skiing. You can't put on rollerblades. You can't do these things. You need to be stretching. You need to be eating these things. No cakes, cookies, chips. Crack, like she's like the three C's, you know, you know, you don't do it because it was just like your body is a, is a temple. It is your, 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 your vehicle that's going to get you there, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when I was little, I was like, I'm giving it all up. You know, it was just kind of, it's not that I didn't have fun or play or, you know, ride a bike or something, but you know, I really did sacrifice so much and I grew up really fast, you know? So what was your plan? Like, what would you have done for college in that? Would you have skipped college and gone mm -hmm. pro because yep. it would have been 18? Is yep. that? Yep. That's what you, that, that's exactly what you do. I mean, some dancers today will do online, you know, schooling. And I know some dancers go to NYU and things like that. Like, but it is a full time, I mean, ballet is a 10 hour job. Sometimes, you know, if you start going into the performance season, which is usually in the fall, winter, and then the summer, you know, those are 14 hour days. I mean, you have class and rehearsals. You have a full eight hours of dancing on your feet before you even go and do a performance in front of thousands of people. I mean, it's like, it's full time plus plus. And so you just really have to be a well oiled machine. And again, have that such discipline in your life to be able to handle all of that. So at 13, I mean, that's what, that's what I was doing. And you know, we'd have to go to bigger cities um, to audition for these big companies because, you know, they were national companies. So, and they also would audition at other companies. So like American Ballet Theater, where I went, they would audition in Seattle or they'd audition in San Francisco where they could use those facilities, you know. Um, so, I mean, my mom would pack me up in the car or we'd get on a plane to go somewhere to, to audition. And, you know, there'd be... 500 people, dancers that come from all over that area. You know, if we were, if ABT was auditioning in San Francisco, I mean, we had all of LA coming up, you know, to audition there. And sometimes that would be the only place for the West Coast. And so we would be filtered in having a couple of auditions and they would just slowly like kind of cut the girls down. Right. But then you didn't get an acceptance that day. You'd have to wait, it's like college you would have to wait six weeks wow. for the mail to come in to see if you got, you know, you'd look at it and you go, okay, is this a, is this a thin envelope or is this a thick envelope? You know what I mean? You know, you know, those are, you know, dude, like that was the most heart wrenching moments in uh, senior year of high school. The, but getting that thick envelope was like, <laughs> you're like, I did it. Yeah. And now I feel so bad for these kids that have to open up emails to get their acceptance letters into colleges because oh, that just seems even more nerve wracking to mm. me just by one click, at least with an envelope, you could kind of tell. <laughs> so you're like, I'm not going to open it. You know? <laughs> or you could say, I got it, you know, without even opening it. And I just think there's a little, it's kind of like Christmas. Like that was kind of a little bit of a present in itself, but Anyway, so I, you know, I would audition for these things and, you know, at 13 years old, you guys, I, I was accepted into the summer intensives at American Ballet Theater, which was the number one ballet school wow. or ballet company in the United States. And it was my dream company. And, you know, I remember having a, a dance teacher there that would say, you know, he'd get up on a stool and he'd go, he'd go, listen, honey, you guys don't have to worry anymore. You're at ABT. 
And it was like, wow. Oh God, we, we made it. But then, you know, there was only 150 of us out, out of, you know, 5,000 dancers that would audition. So I have a quick question about like habits and stuff, because mm-hmm. this, I mean, obviously what you're describing is very, very, like you said, like highly skilled, highly focused, like what, how were you able to stay so focused at a young age to do that? Cause like, I mean, I remember myself at that age, there's no chance I could pull something like that off. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I was like focused on sports and school, like whatever, but, um, but this is like a whole other level. I, I was trying to think about that because I don't, it was just, it was just in me. It was ingrained in, 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 in my blood and it's just what I wanted to do and I didn't see anything else. Um, but also I think that it's, it depends on the t- like, I guess like kids today even, or maybe when you were a kid, like it was like the emphasis, it's like, where was the emphasis? Was the emphasis on you going to school and then playing recreational sports and then, you know, having time to watch cartoons, you know, like where was your emphasis for me? It was like, I already had put that emphasis, like, my emphasis is ballet and I'm going to do everything to live, eat and breathe it. And it just stuck. And it's, I mean, it's a great question. And I feel like, I feel like what you're saying is like, if you love it, you'll do anything because that's what you love and that's what you're going for. Like I was at the age of seventh grade, sixth, seventh grade, it was all about film school and like making home mo- home movies and editing them on iMovie. But it was also playing football, playing lacrosse, going to the park, playing baseball with your friends. So it was like, I had no formal film classes I could take even, not even in high school. So like it, I couldn't even study film properly until college. Um, you could do like jobs before then, like, but nothing that intense or even that official. It was all, yeah. But isn't that, isn't it so telling though to kind of think about what, like think about what you were doing when you were that age and the fact that it has come to fruition now. Yeah. Like it is kind of, it it is kind of pretty telling um, because I think that those creative juices and your passions and what lights you up and what spark gives you that spark, you know, it really does kind of develop when you're that age, you know? And then the rest of your life, you're just trying to figure out how to do it, you know? And you you try on all these different, you know, hats of, oh, I'm going to try this or I'm going to try this. But it's like, but what did I love? You know, what have I always loved? And, and you know, that's kind of the sad part of my story is that I'm not a ballerina. I never became a full professional. I got right up, you know, to it. And then it collapsed and and... Um, now I'm trying to figure out how do I use all of that discipline and that uh, creative energy that I, in artistry that I have always had and was, you know, born with, and it was a given gift to me by God that how do I do that and use that now in my life? And it's kind of been interesting because it's like, I have to have multiple outlets to kind of fill that void because ballet was so huge that it just kind of, you know, when that bubble burst for me, it was like dev- devastating. I didn't know what else to do with my life. I literally had no clue because there was no other outlet for me or I had no other vision other than this is what I'm doing, you know? So that's really interesting. And I also had a friend that asked me like, well, what would you tell parents like if their kids like, what would you tell your younger self, you know? And I think for me, I, sh- I, w- I was like, well, to lighten up, you know, because it's like there is so much more in the world other than just that, um, that one thing that I loved. And I wish I would have been a little lightened up because I probably, well, I'm still telling myself that as an adult, but mm-hmm. yeah, like I, I do need to lighten up, but like, I think I should have enjoyed doing other things so that I knew that the importance of when something doesn't go right, it's okay. And you, you've got other things to do, you know, Mm. but that's, that, that's, 
the I think the hindsight now, you know, but. Yeah, like yeah. nurturing a few other interests and hobbies and things just to like, okay, you know, if this doesn't work out, then I got that. Or, mm-hmm. But I can't, I mean, I literally like couldn't imagine, um, you know, losing something like that, like losing film or, you know, but, but you're totally right. There are so many other things in the world to throw yourself into that are beautiful yeah. and, and amazing and, and require a high level of precision and skill and um, loved in order to, you know, achieve and, and do. Um, but that's, yeah, it's really interesting. I think that, that I'm so grateful for the, that foundation that I was given though, through ballet of, of the structure and the discipline. I mean, the, dis, the discipline word is just so, so huge because it, it's allowed me as an adult to have the discipline that I have now. And it's like, it's, it's like a regimen. It's like military-esque, you know, it's just, it has never left me. Um, I think I'm learning a little bit more balance, but you know, (laughs) it's it's so beautiful in the sense that um, you showed yourself what you're capable of and to the push it to the highest degree that you possibly could. And you got to, you know, the, the number one school you wanted to get to, you were laser focused and you saw the ramifications of that or the results of that because of that. You know, you it showed you that that's how I always felt when I was young with wor- working out. I was super skinny. I was bullied. I was made fun of. Um, I didn't feel confident. Or, and when I found working out, I became obsessed. And to the point where somebody like people would tell me all the time you're never gonna get in shape you're never gonna have muscle you're too skinny i was 135 pounds at 6'3 dripping wet you know like a blow away in the wind mm-hmm. and i just didn't stop and i was doing six hours a day i was my sleep my food my my i didn't go out and party during high, in high school mm-hmm. i you know i was just like i'm gonna watch bodybuilding movies and and videos and read books and study nutrition and do everything i can in my power and in in a way it's a singular sport as well as like anything that I did wrong showed, you know, it's not like I can get away mm. with, with, um, you know, uh, slacking or going out with the boys and I can go and play baseball or something like that. And then we can all have a team. I can kind of be a little more lazy in the outfield. Maybe I miss a play or something like that. If, if I mess up, you know, if I'm not in the shape that I want to be in or, or what, what I could be, it shows and I can't hide any of that. So that's why I fell in love with that. And that self-discipline I found played into you know, my career and, and what I'm willing to do, the work I'm willing to put in, and then knowing that the results that will come out of it because of it. And I think that was a great gift is, you know, I wanted to be when I was younger in high school, a bodybuilder. As soon as I got older and I healed parts of myself, I didn't need that anymore uh, to be the biggest, strongest guy. I am mm-hmm. a big, strong guy. Don't get me wrong, but I didn't need that anymore. But I realized, oh, that's opening up all these doors for what my real dreams are, what my real passions are, which is acting and then producing and then getting into directing and then everything else I do too. But um, it, it, I, the path I thought was meant for me actually put me on the path that I'm supposed to be on. And I, and I, I've said this multiple times, but, and maybe I'll change my mind at some later point, but I always say I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be here. And whether that's to share one story at one time with somebody at the right moment, or whether it's, you know, to help influence millions of people to live a better life. I don't know what it's going to be, but either way, I'm grateful I'm here. And I've had the, I have gratitude for the friends that I've had, you know, I've Mm -hmm. got new family, uh, you guys, both of you guys, and um, it's changed my life in such beautiful ways. And and I'm, when I'm listening to this, it's like, you have such a a beauty and a strength in you and such a power. and, And to see that translated, like, I've never not been happy around you. I've never gotten a big hug. You know, I, I've never not had incredible food. You know, like I, <laughs> there's there's never been a bad time around you. And and it it you know you said talking about that spark. I've seen that spark in you since we met. Where it it's whether you're dancing or not, you have that. You know, and it's it's uh, infectious. You know, and and I I just want to say like I I see that and and I appreciate that and I'm I'm grateful that you share that oh. with the world in whatever scale you do. You know. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that story too about you that it's it's also kind of dangerous too when you're that age and yeah. so focused on something and then you know it, it could very it's like it's like love and hate you know it's just like it's very very close my husband and I talk about it all the time it's mm-hmm. just like it's something that is so closely related you know because it can go one way yeah. or the other very quickly and I think 
too, with that discipline and just being so focused on one thing can really tip on in a good way or yeah. it can go really in a bad way. And, yeah. you know, I kind of, I actually ended up tipping on in a, in a bad way, but you know, that in itself has, has been able to land me in my strengths and empathy for people that have lost dreams or mm. have, you know, broken lives that they thought that they were going to end up being at someplace and they're not. Yeah. And, you know, that, that was kind of, that's kind of huge for me too. But, um, you know, thanks for saying the compliment about Spar. I always go, it's easy to compliment why do people, you. why do people, why, why do people like my food? I mean, I'm not a trained chef, but it's like, and, you know, it's like when Will says we're going, we're going to dad's house for, for dinner. It's like, why do, why, why do people why do you like coming for dinner? <laughs> you know, other than, you know. <laughs> Healthy and delicious. And Penny yeah. freaks out every time. Uh, anyways, yeah. but. It's, and it's interesting, like, hearing you guys talk about that, too, because, I mean, I'm definitely, like, I'm more on the casual side of working out, but I'm also very goal-orientated. So, like, mm -hmm. I had a Europe trip planned a couple years ago, and I go, okay, I'm going to see a nutritionist, I'm going to pick a body fat to get down to and I'm going to stick to a program for three, four months and like, okay, that'll be my, my window. Yeah. And then once I get there, I'm like, okay, I'm good for a little bit and I kind of chill, but, and then it kind of goes more in waves because mm -hmm. like you and Brock are both so on top of it all the time. It's, it's, amazing but it's also like I, I feel like I come at it from a different perspective of you know I'm, maybe I'll set a goal and then I'll kind of you know stray away from it for a little bit and then um, but you guys are I guess you both had kind of like professions that are based off of how your body feels where your body's at and like very specific to that mm -hmm. so maybe that plays a part but I know you guys are both so like disciplined and committed um, regardless. So like maybe that isn't all of it. Right. It's, it's, uh, I was actually talking about this to a guy in the coffee shop earlier today. Uh, we just started a random yeah, conversation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I was sharing with him, there's this quote I, I fell in love with uh, when I was, you know, managing a, a moving company and uh, junk hauling. And I came across this professor and they wanted us to haul all this junk in the backyard and it had probably 10,000 spiders on it. And my, I just hired my little brother as our first job. He's like, I'm not oh, yeah. doing that. And I was like, uh, we signed up to do the job. So I'm doing the job, give me some gloves and I'm gonna go to work. And through me doing that work, my brother eventually joined in cause I was gonna do it regardless. Um, a couple spiders was the worst was gonna happen just die, you know? Um, but anyways, we got the job done. And while we were signing the paperwork at the end of it, I asked this, this professor, I said, you know, when I found out he was a professor, I was like, do you have any advice for me and my brother? You know, I wasn't in school. Um, I couldn't afford community college. Um, I was trying to just work my way through, you know, just having a job before I committed to my dreams. And he said, bring your own uniqueness to the world. And then he also told me this advice. It said, be true to thine own self. And I have carried those two things with me since that day, ever since. And so when you talk about that, Will, about, you know, us being able to, to dedicate ourselves in a, in a different manner, you know, we all have different strengths, if different, you know, uh, you know, the way we think, we show up differently in the world, we have different gifts, right? And it's, what are your gifts? And I, I heard this thing from Jim Carrey one time that I, I have always loved. And he said, um, I wish that everyone could be rich and famous so that they can see that that's not the goal. That's not the dream. You know, that's, that's not what it's all about. Oh, you know? absolutely. And, and hearing that it's like, we all have, you know, we, we show up in this thing. It's, we're not all supposed to be this one way and us being different is so incredible and so beautiful because that's what makes this whole thing unique. You know, um, your, your ability with wine and your, your dancing and, and your, your passion for food and, and caretaking and everything that you do. And Will, you're like, your ability to deep dive something and, and you're creative and becoming a writer over the last year and, and all of the incredible, like the producing you do, like all of the different unique stuff, but we're still here sitting together and, and sharing those things together that helps us grow as, as, a, as a people, you know? It's, it's fascinating to me and I think it's so cool to see, like we can be different, but we can still respect and love and admire each other in ways that, you know, maybe we might not even see in ourselves, you know? So it's just, to that, I don't know, even know where I'm going with this, but like no. it's it's very 
cool to be a, a, a witness to, to both of you, honestly. I have to, I have to interject on this because um, just like that, that teacher that told us, like, you don't have to worry anymore. You're at ABT, you know. It's funny, like, I think I am older than you guys a little bit. But, you know, in the last two years, I would say I, I am getting to a, a, a point where I'm kind of looking back on my life and going, oh, shit, like, everything really does work out. Mm. You, you know, it, it's like... We are so consumed, I think, when we're little and then when we're, you know, what are you going to be when you're going to grow up? I, you know, there's that, that every, you know, I think our parents always asked us that with our generation, like, what do you want to be when you grow up and what are you going to do? And, you know, it's like, oh, my kids in high school, what are they going to do when they, you know, what are their motives? What are they like doing? And where are they going to go to college? And, you know, it's just, there's such a focus on what's your identity? You know, what are the things that make you, you, you know, it's like, do we, labeling everybody, mm -hmm. you know, when we get so tied up in what are we labeled as? I was a ballerina. I was, you know, an anorexic. I was, you know, a personal chef. I was a wedding planner. I was working for Discovery Land Company. You know, I was so literally up until a couple of years ago where even to the point where I kind of was, you know, kind of fighting to change my job title a little mm -hmm. bit just because I'm like, I want to encompass a little bit more of everything that I do, you know, and that's, you know, just to kind of give it, just to broaden it because I didn't want to be sucked into one title. And I think, you know, to what you're saying, it's like, you know, it all works out. You know, you don't have to worry so much about what job you're going to do or, you know, who you're going to be and how much money you're going to make and where you're going to live you kind of are going to like, like I look back and I go, did I ever think I was going to live in LA? Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> uh, never. That's and, funny. and it's like, but now I see where I'm at in my life and all of my gifts and talents and abilities and who I am and my personality. And even a little bit of the lifestyle, like a little bit of the lifestyle that I like for myself and my husband, like it's all working out. Mm -hmm. You know, you just have to trust the growth, the process, the fails, the bubbles being completely burst mm -hmm. because you have to realize that we, this is all done by design and, and in the end, it all works out and it's a beautiful picture. Yeah. And I feel like as I'm maturing a little bit more, I'm starting to look, step back and look at the picture and go, oh, wow, this is, there was a really great artist that put this together for me and mm -hmm. I see the picture, you know? Wow. And, and I, I, I think I'm just starting to realize that. And, and it's, I think it's just more as I'm starting to peel away from titles and definitions of myself. And um, I think that's something really important to, yeah. to, for people to hear. Yeah, pull away from the idea of what you thought you were supposed to be. Yeah, and just let it happen. A question I always come back to for myself is, uh, are you happy and fulfilled mm -hmm. in what I do, you know, and, and how I show up in the world and the relationships I have, you know, it's, I'm grateful to wake up every morning and I'm grateful for the family and the friends I have and the life I have. And, you know, that young kid that I used to be, if he saw where I'm at now, he would be losing his mind. Mm -hmm. And I'm now nowhere near where I envision and see myself and where I'm going to work towards. And I don't know if I'm going to get there or not. But regardless, if I can just take a step back. It took me over a year when I first got, like, I was, you know, sleeping on couches. I slept in my car for a couple months. I was trying to figure it out. I was broke. I was, you know, I just no idea what I was doing and just trying to stay in LA to make this dream because I knew I had to be here for whatever reason. And when I finally made or got my first job in acting. I start, finally started making money and uh, got my first place. First time I lived in an apartment for more than a year. It took me over a year and a half to stop, pause, and look around as like, what the heck? I just did it. I, mm. I got out. I changed my stars, you know? And, and it's, it's hard to be so present in that mindset. And, uh, but when you do it and you look and you're like, I have a loving family, you know, you, you have a beautiful uh, family, husband, uh, mm -hmm. life, you know, and, and when you just take those key little moments and you add them together, it's like, 
it, it might not have been what you had envisioned for yourself, but it's pretty damn good, you know? Yeah, totally, totally. Trusting the process for sure. I, I really identify with like the not labeling too. Like I, cause I was on the call, was on one of my conference calls with my production company and I literally listed every, the, the requirement for the list was like, perf, like things that are full-time professions that uh, is a hat that I'm wearing. Right. And obviously any startup that's going to be true for anybody in any small business and any startup this isn't like something that's special to me, but I just started listing them all. And there were like 20 things and I'm like, well, fucking shit. Like that's, that's what it takes sometimes. Right. Yeah. To like, if you're pursuing a new dream or starting a new small business or whatever it is, it's like, it, I know it can seem stressful now, but just trust the process and don't get caught up with labels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And I, I think that is a very, Valuable. Ad. Speaking of labels, <laughs> I, I'm going to turn the conversation uh, a little bit to the left of the table yeah. to a few beautiful labels mm -hmm. right there. Um, we have a Meldman family estate Cabernet. Is it Cab? It's a, it's a Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah. It's Private label. Private label. And then a beautiful Napa Valley buttery Chardonnay on the uh, right <laughs> side. Nice buttery Chard. Um, <laughs> And I'll let you kind of, you know, take us through this yeah. process because you're the expert. Level yeah. two, yeah. sommelier. Yeah. Going to level four. On your next date. <laughs> um, you know, I think with the wine roll, you want to help me pass out? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> um, we're going to start obviously with the white. You always start with the lighter than, than the dark. Okay. Okay. So. Um, or this is a red glass. Uh, no. No. Right? You're good. No, you're good. Um, is there a difference in glasses? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. With um, you don't have to drink the whole thing. Sorry. So red just, is a typically a more circular, wider, larger. Yes. Okay. So I've got a good story for you about um, about your pops, and um, you know, I he he asked me, you know, I've been with the company, I've done many different jobs. But he asked me to, you know, my husband was always so kind. He was just like, you know, you got to you gotta have Abby cook for you, you know. And so it was like one of those things where we, um, I was just like, yeah, sure, Mike, I'll, I'll cook for you. And I remember him asking me, like, do you mind just cooking a few meals for us here and there? And he's just, I was like, of course, like it was something I could do. And he goes, well, you know, I've never had anyone kind of just cook for me at home the way you do, you know? And he just, he just loved, he just loved it. So I was like, Ab absolutely on top of all the other hats that I wear and whatever. But how I got into wine too, was that he started purchasing a lot of expensive first growth, beautiful wines from France and Italy. And I remember sitting in on that meeting and being like, Oh shit. Like he's going to ask me to manage this, <laughs> you know? And I just go, you know, I was like, okay, this, this is happening. And before that order even came in, then it was like COVID, you know, oh, wow. kind of hit too. But prior to that in 2019, right before, before COVID, um, you know, I, you know, obviously being the disciplined girl that was like, okay, well, if he's going to ask me to cook, I'm going to be the best home cook ever. And so I was just studying and studying and studying. And so I would study Thomas Keller and get his book. And then I would watch his master classes. And then I was, I mean, I was like, I'm such a self learner and driven to teach myself. And, you know, even through my eating disorder, like how I learned how to cook was because I read recipes and I, and I watched Martha Stewart and Barefoot Contest, you know, and I just, because I wouldn't eat, I would, you know, at that time, I would just learn food that way. And so I just had all, I like, it was an encyclopedia. I just, it was like a, learning a language. It was in my brain. And I was like, oh yeah, I know how to make this dressing and I know how to do this and I know how to sear the meat. And so then I would just do it and perform. You know, I was like, a you know, a dancer. I can perform. I can cook the food. So your dad knew my love of Thomas Keller. And I asked him last night at dinner, I go, can I share the Thomas Keller story? It's like, you have to. <laughs> and it's funny because, you know, he hosts very important people. And, you know, I'm sitting there and I'll, I'll go around the table and I'll start pouring the wine. And he'll go, 
you know, I've got a great story about Abby. <laughs> so, <laughs> then he pulls this story out. Your dad loves to tell these great stories. Um, the other really cool thing about him is I just think he gets a kick out of really blessing people or just like doing something that just he knows that they that he that they're going to love and that it's going to be a memory that like a core memory that they'll always have. And I think that's kind of a key thing with discovery too, is that it's great at producing core memories and for families. And, um, anyways, so he takes me Well, I get an email. I'm at whole foods shopping for the house and, um, I get an email from his assistant at the office and it's like, well, add Abby to the flight plan. And I was like, and I look at it and I go, Oh no, am I going to like, do I need to go help? Like, your dad on this or do, does he need me to be there with him or something like that? So it was like going up to Napa and I go, okay, well, uh, I, I said, I, I called her and I said, what, what is this? Why am I on this? And she goes, Oh, you're going to the French laundry mm. with Mike. And Hell I go, yeah. and I go, I go, no, I'm not. No, no, I'm not. And she's like, yes, yes, you are. And she's like, he's skipping around the office telling people that he's going to take you. <laughs> To the French That's laundry. So cool. He's so excited. And I go, no, you don't understand, Trish. I was like, I am, I'm not worthy. I, I'm not good enough. I can't meet him. He's like an idol to me. And and then I said, I can't, I can't do it. She goes, just think about it. Call me back in 10 minutes. I said, okay, I'm in the grocery store. Then I call my husband and I go, Mike wants me to wants to take me to the French laundry. I can't go. I just can't do it. You have to. He goes, Aww. Abby, he goes, he called, he called me and he says, you know, can I, can Abby have a hall pass? <laughs> and, and it was, it was because I'm so in love with Thomas Keller. And my favorite quote of his is cooks cook to nurture. And that's, I think truly mm. like kind of the heart of why I love cooking for the family and, you know, being there. It's just, it's a I'm great just, quote. yeah, I'm just there to nurture people. And I think that's a, that's the heart of what I do, but he's like, you know, he told him and he's like, I really want to take her up to, to see Thomas Keller. I just want to make sure that you're okay with it because, you know, she's really in love with him. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, do it. It's fine. It'll be great or whatever. So I, you know, he's like, Abby, you have to go. And I'm like, I'm not going. You don't understand. I can't go. And like the plane's leaving in a few hours because you have to go and you have to, dinner's early. And I was like, I don't, I, I can't go. So then I'm on the phone with my mom. Then Trisha calls me back. She goes, you don't understand. You have to go. You have to get Did on the plane. Did you end up going? Yes. But it was, it was, it was a, a tragic story. I'd cried all my makeup off. Uh. I had to, you know, go, go to the Mac counter at like Nordstrom's or something. Uh. The best, the best part of the story too is like, I got a, like the, person I had to buy a new pair of shoes. I was wearing a dress that day, but I was wearing sneakers. So I bought a pair of designer shoes to go with my dress. <laughs> and, and that's how my husband baited me into going. He's like, oh, you can buy whatever pair of shoes you want <laughs> to, oh, to get sweet. on that plane. So we go, but the, the girl that helped me with the shoes, she was a ballerina. Oh, wow. And, and she just, I just, it was, I was always just talking like, I, like I always need these cues, you know, but anyways, that was my cue. And so I go to the Mac counter, get my makeup on, show up to your dad. And I'm like, ready, you know, and just nervous as hell. Get up to uh, Napa with him and Uncle JJ's there and they're walking in ahead of me. And I think, OK, it's going to be fine. I'm going to go sit down or whatever. But no, Thomas Keller is standing at the doorway, greeting people as they come in. So then your dad walks in, gives him a big hug. And then Uncle JJ walks in and then your dad just like flips over and goes, and this is Abby. And I just go, and I just start crying, oh, just dude. bawling. And I just, because it's like when you meet that idol, when you meet that person that sweet talks you, you know, about something that you love, you just, it's just that moment. It's like, I've met a, a lot of celebrities. I meet a lot of people, but that guy mm -hmm. can just put me on my knees. And I sure, I, and he grabs my hand and he holds my hand and he whisks me into the back of the kitchen and gets me a glass of champagne, gets me an apron. And he's like, just come tour. And I just, you know, but I went back and he showed me the wine cylinder. I was like, okay, I have to be mm -hmm. this good. Okay. Back to the wine. But it's like, then when I knew your dad was getting 
you know, some So you got a tour of the wine. kitchen, you got to see everything in the French laundry. Yes. You got, that sounds amazing. It got the meal, but walking through that cellar, I was like, okay, I have to make, I have to be this good mm. because I just, that's, again, that's that discipline in me that's just like, I can't not be the best, you yeah. know, and I'm going to put everything in it to be the best. So I was like, I got to be this good. So then I decided, okay, I got to go, I got to get my, I have to become a psalm. And I, it was just one of the things like, add it to your list, Abby. So I, so I did. And fortunately, I mean, unfortunately, but with when COVID hit and all the kids are from home from school, my husband and I both decided, well, this is a great opportunity for us to both go back to school. So he went in to get his modern art, um, you know, courses and, and wow. to kind of get a degree in modern art. And then I, um, went to Psalm school and my, uh, Psalm school is actually through Napa Valley, which, which we're going to be drinking. And you can probably already smell it. It's smelling very oaky and, and buttery. But then um, we um, uh, went, you know, we just wanted to set an example, you know, to all the kids that, you know, we're all going back to school and at home it's like, well, us adults are going to go back to school too. So we did. And through this, it has made me a totally different wine drinker and uh, managing wine. And so now when I go through or when I go, oh, I want a glass of wine, I don't necessarily think about what kind of wine I want. I actually think about the region that I want. Like, what am I feeling? You know, am I feeling it's summertime and, you know, I would love something refreshing and light from, you know, a warmer climate that's going to have a crisper, fresher, brighter wine. Or, you know, this beautiful cloudy day in L.A., it's like a Chardonnay is great, you know, because it's it's, it's, it's a bigger white wine. It's more cozy. It's going to be, you know, all of that. So, you know, sometimes when you take a girl out to a date, boys, you know, you can go, are we going to an Italian restaurant? Are we going to go to Thai food? Are we going to have sushi? It can help you kind of play around with your wines and then just text me and I'll tell you mm. what to get. Okay. <laughs> just tell me the menu. For those out there who can't text you, what's a good, like, What's a good way? So you said think of the region. Yes. Right? And yeah. then that can kind of affect it. What are some other like kind of detailed things people can consider? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, um, you want to be, you know, you don't want to have, um, let's say you don't want to have a light meal with a huge heavy wine, you know? So if you're going to eat on the lighter, healthier side, go for a lighter wine. So, you know, especially like if you were a red wine drinker, you know, you'd want to maybe go for a Pinot Noir or in France, it's a, it's a Burgundy, which is made with Pinot Noir grapes, or you could do some Italian wines that have, you know, like Northern Italian red wines. They're lighter because they're in a cool climate. So the grapes don't get ripened. You know, this red that we're going to sample here in a second, you know, it's a big California wine. It gets a lot of sunshine. The grapes have more time to ripen. So they're going to be more sugar content, which is going to be a higher alcohol content, which is going to be, you know, it's just going to be bigger. And you're going to taste it because think of that, that sun time that it gets versus shorter growth time for certain other grapes around the world. Just think of where it's at, kind of the latitude and longitude. Right. You know, you want to think about, that uh, so more sunlight right. me and means more flavor because you're getting more nutrients and more sugar and all that like you said bigger yeah it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be bigger but then also too it's like you know both of these wines are aged and maturated which means maturing in uh in oak caskets and that time in that oak is another added layer of flavor mm. and it's actually what they call the third layer or to touch or i'm going to say it wrong but the third layer of flavor when you're tasting the wine is going to be that oak that you're going to taste but we can already even smell it here yeah. so when you're with a girl you know and here's the thing I love it. You guys are already holding the stems. When you're with on a date, this is the one thing I can't pinky, stand yeah. about. No, you don't have to do the pinky. <laughs> <laughs> but you're holding the glass correctly. If you're standing, if you're all night with, you know, on a date and you're holding a wine glass like this, you're going to warm up the wine and you're actually going to change the flavor wow. of the wine. And I see so many dudes that just drink wine like this. Yeah. I mean, and it drives I, me crazy. And even I'm females. And yeah. I'm catching it on movies and TV shows. I'm just like, oh, they're holding the wine glass wrong. It, it, you like know? That, right? Yes. Or like yeah. Or, or just, just this. Yeah. And I guess it's the casual setting. If you want to do this, this is fine. But I'll never forget 
serving a glass of wine and a professional waiter, this is before I went to school, yelled at me and was just like, they call it a stemmed glass for a reason. You serve it the, with the stem. Wow. You yeah, know, because like I actually, I served the glass like this and that was a huge no-no. So it's just really important that you hold this because also you're letting, if you do this, you're going to bring warmth to it and change the flavor. One reason I've learned to do that too, a little trick I learned is the cheers, the bell. Yes. So to you, if you're holding it here, you can't make that the noise that the glass can make, right? Yeah. So cheers. So, cheers. Okay. Cheers. I would cheers. like to ask you guys, what are the first things that you smell? Uh, a buttery oak smell. No. <laughs> so the first thing you wouldn't, when, when you're sampling wine, actually the first thing you do is look at the color. The so next thing, at, okay, yeah. you Wait. look at the color and you're just staring at the color just because you're like, it gives you, like this is a little bit of a, of a you know, if we had a Sauvignon Blanc here, it's going to be lighter in color. Because this is a darker yellow, you're going to actually say, okay, this is a, a darker colored white wine. And that can give you a hint as to whether it's been in oak or, or not, or mm. maybe a steel barrel, um, which is a lot are maturated in steel barrels. So I can already tell this is a darker color, so it's going to be that. Then you go into smell it. You go, why do people smell it? Well, that's the first note that you're going to hit about smelling. It's going to give you the first cues about this wine. Is it acidic? You do you smell the acid first in the yeah. wine, right? So that's what you're smelling. Is it an acidic wine? Is it not acidic? Does it smell sweet? Does it um, have any floral ar aromas to it? Do you smell lemon? Do you smell, that's what you're gonna smell. Oak wines, typically you're going to smell the oak. You know, you're right. gonna say, okay, I can kind of smell that mustiness. That's the mm. oak in it, so. When it comes to white, I feel like there's, at least for me, I have like my own little spectrum and it's like oaky and then buttery. It's like the two are kind of at the end. I know you can have kind of both, but it's like one is very uh, sweet and then the other is very oaky. Well, but the oak and the butter actually are both because of an oak barrel. You okay. know, so the oaky and the but the butteriness is actually coming from that oak. Or I guess it's like sweet and then oaky and then buttery can be... Almost either. Well, this is definitely, this is going to be <laughs> definitely, and they also describe it as bready because sometimes it can smell yeasty too. Okay. And that's kind of that same, that think of bread and butter, that kind of that mm. bigger, you know, taste. But, but, you know, for this, it's actually pretty a, a bright Chardonnay. I mean, it, I can smell the oak for sure, but I can also smell lemon. Mm. You know, it, there's and, a little And floral. for people out there, we're drinking and the- The Fontenay. Farniente. Yep. Farniente. Use your use your French. Come on. Yeah, Mr. yeah. Mr. Far, <laughs> I mean, I guess I would say that like Neil, but yep. like if you pronounce the T, it'd be like Niente. Yeah. <laughs> Which is like Spanish. Yep. Yeah. So this one's actually going to be kind of quite crisp. And also, while we can tell about that too, is I immediately look and see what the vintage is. This is a two uh, a 2021. So this is a newer vintage. If it was older, like if we were going to drink a 2018, you know, even if it was that, you know, five years younger, um, you know, it's going to not be as bright as this. Mm. It's actually going to be more, you know, um, yeasty or, you know, the oakiness. It's going to be more subtle, but because this is a newer, fresher vintage, you know, quite young, actually, it's going to smell brighter. You know, it's, it didn't, it didn't sit in the oak barrels that long. So that's why we're, but you know, when it's match rates are sitting in the bottle, you know, it's going to, did the flavor is going to develop and change and things like that. Okay. White, white wines, you typically don't want to drink an older vintage uh, just because they can tend to go bad. Unlike, um, yeah, unlike red wines, you know, do really well um, maturing. So let's, uh, let's move on to the okay. red because we, we have limited yep. time here. So we'll do like a Meldman family is, estate, yes. 2011 private reserve Napa Valley. Gorgeous decanters. So again, smell it, look at the color, smell it. We're looking at the color, then we're smelling, and then. And the color actually helps you decide too about the body, about the wine. Is it is it going to be a big body? Is it going to be lighter body? Um, you know, this is darker. It, this Obviously, is dark, this is yeah. going to this is really dark. So this is going to actually. Then you go to smell it, swirl it around, because that helps with the aromas. 
Does that just I mean, this bring is it a to bank. the yeah? yeah what it what just, are all it, the yeah? Like yeah, when they, people they, do like the, the they the they're doing this because it. they're opening up the aromas into oh, yeah. the you know the wine. You're going to get a better sniff about it. Also, you're oxygenating the wine a little bit more, which is going to help develop the flavors mm. of 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 the wine. So. I mean, fruity, you, right? It's very fruity, deep berries. Yeah. Um, you know, Cabernets also have some licorice in it a little bit. Um, Cabernet Sauvignons are usually blended also with Merlot. The Merlot helps it make it smoother. Merlot has a little bit of more of like a blueberry in it. Higher alcohol content too, right? Yes. Yeah. Good job. Yes. Cause mm -hmm. you can smell that acidity and actually you can smell alcohol obviously. And when you can really smell that alcohol smell, you're going to go, okay, California wines are typically actually more in the 14 percent or higher wow. range of alcohol versus Italy is going to be like in the 11, wow. you know, to 13 percent. So oh, wow, yeah. California, wine, 14 and a half. Sorry, see, there you go. So yeah, <laughs> I did go to school. Ladies and gentlemen, she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyways, yeah, good job. Well, yeah, you can smell, but this one's very, very dark and this is a 2011. So this is uh 13, 12, 12 years old. So cheers. 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 This will be really good. Mm. Huh. It's actually really good. Mm -hmm. I like it. See how that has a long finish. Yeah. Part of that is it's maturity. You know, you're not getting so much of that alcohol. The tannins have kind of calmed down. So it's going to be a lot smoother because it's older, you right. know, it's, it's aged. It's fine, you know? Mm. Um, but this is, delicious because it has been aged now if it was younger it would be it would be biting and gripping our jaws a little bit more you know because it's it's got that grip and um the bite it hasn't smoothed out so this has done really well anyways makes sense got a good name on it yeah but how, now i'm how so how long impressed. could you age uh this wine i mean it's very important to keep climate control with your wine so don't 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 have a house and then keep your wine out and then turn off the AC in the summer and leave for two months. And you know, you're going to come back and your wine's going to be sour. It's, you know, mm. it's not that the wine went bad. It's just, you have to keep it in climate control. It's just really important um, that the, the wine doesn't go up and down and up and down in temperature. So um, when you keep it like that, I mean, this could age, you know, 30 plus years, you know, at least, um, wow. and you can, you can drink it then, but 10 years from now, I we should like, have another drink of the Melvin. It, yeah. Totally, totally. <laughs> I like to drink my reds right around that 20-year mark. Um, that's kind of like the prime and my favorite, right? I mean, I've only gotten a couple chances to taste it from your dad was a Chateau Latour 2000, mm. a 2000 Chateau Latour. And it's just, it's literally silk because it's just mellowed so much and you just taste the grapes and their, and their beauty of, of, you know, maturing. And so- Anyways, oh, yeah. Pep. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we got to get out of here. Got to go. We got to go. Thank you so, so much for yeah. coming on, for sharing everything that you did, for your time. We love you. You're amazing. Love you thank guys. You. Yeah. This Thanks, was, brother. I actually, I learned a ton in that kind of short amount of time we had to go over wine. I actually learned a lot and we appreciate it. Thank you for watching Studio 22. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And follow our socials at Studio 22 Podcast.